find out where I am, and then a fair amount about what it's like to work in a zoo. Not so much. I'm trying to give you interesting examples that make different points. So feel free. You know, it's a, we'll keep it informal. If you have questions, feel free to raise your hand. I don't mind. Um, or afterwards, if you have questions, I'm happy to hang around for a while. As long as they don't pull my car in the student parking lot. It was hard to find a place to park when they get here. Um, so I understand that a lot of people are doing mock interviews tonight. That's a really good idea. My approach to interviewing was just keep applying until they find them at So my interview is a good idea. How many students here are animal science majors? Huh? Biology majors? So, so when I was in med school, which was a few years ago, it was about 80% biology and only about 20% animal science. And they've really been pushing to get more people to take animal science classes. That's great. How about how many? I know you all get into vet school, so when you get into vet school, how many of you want to do small animals? Okay, large animals? Huh? Other things? Exotics? Everybody. Good. So this is what you know, when people think about working at a zoo, uh, they think about working with exotic animals or wildlife. The animal planet has really, I think, increased people's awareness and maybe given them an inappropriate perception of what zoo vets do. We're kind of all numb to the duties of animals, things like guarding things out of a helicopter that's not me, uh, or working on you know, exciting, cool things in zoos. That's part of it, but it's certainly not like any other area of, med of medicine. Exactly when you see the chosen animal planet, our lives aren't exactly like that. If you want a fancy office and you want to make a lot of money, you're in the wrong profession. Go into human medicine. Many times more, you basically do the same thing. The difference is in human medicine, you work on one part of one species. In veterinary medicine, you work on lots of parts of lots of species. So in my opinion, veterinarians are much better trained than physicians. You will approach your animals based on science. You will look at the clinical science and make a diagnosis based on physiology and medicine, not out of a procedure manual. And you can mess if a patient does this, then you do this test and this prescription. And then you're messing your challenge all the time because even if your patient, even if you see just cattle, you're going to see different parts of them. You're going to work on their feet or their teeth or their rumen. You're not doing just hands of a person. So, in my opinion, it gives you a lot more variety. I was asked regularly, I was asked tonight, what's an average day like? And in, in any area of veterinary medicine, you have a lot of variety. In zoo medicine, you have constant variety. And that's one of the things I like the most. I want this job to suck just a little bit less than being unemployed. <laughs> so let's start talking about career track. You guys are uh, at the first step now, trying to get into business school, right? That's the first step. Get in, go to college, and study really hard. That's what you're doing, right? You all get into vet school, no doubt. And then you get into vet school and you study really hard. How many veterinary schools in the United States specialize in zoo medicine? Offer degrees in zoo medicine. How many offer degrees in food animal medicine? Small medicine? They don't, right? You study the same thing. You go to vet school, you study the same thing as everybody else in your class. And if you choose to specialize, you do it afterwards. So you're going to study dogs and cats and horses and cows and pigs. Depending on where you go, you may study birds. You may study companion reptiles. You may get an opportunity to do some zoo or wild application, but your main focus is going to be on domestic animals because that's where the bulk of the knowledge is and the bulk of the jobs are. Now, I, I have the perception, and I don't keep that close track, that the veterinary schools are now really encouraging students to look at alternative careers because the pet practice market is getting saturated. Food and animal, I think, is still a growing market, but they're looking for people who have alternative career plans, so research, or zoo, or wildlife, or academia, things like that. So keep your options open. When I started vet school, I wanted to work with livestock, because I like working outside. And then when I got to vet school, I realized that livestock medicine has financial constraints. It's a business. So a farmer's not going to spend $2,000 fixing a cow that's worth $500 in the market. It's just simple business. So I decided to switch to, to pet practice because clients will pay exorbitant amounts for pet medicine. So you get to do a higher quality medicine. I don't mean to disparage food animal medicine. It's good medicine, but it's, it's a business. Farmers are, are in it to make a living. They're not keeping cattle, cattle and pigs for pets. So I switched to zoo to have pet practice because I thought it'd be more challenging. I didn't think about working in a zoo until I was halfway through vet school and a zoo vet, like we came and talked to the class. I thought, hey, wow, that sounds cool. Before I go into vet school, I had I was following the wildlife management track for a master's degree in wildlife management. I'm really excited to go to vet school, and all of a sudden I thought these three things 
fit together, if I could work in the two, I could follow both, both of my career options. Out of my graduating class, about, when we started high school, probably, my class was 85, probably 20 people changed their focus during vet school, got completely different ideas. One guy was hardcore small animals, ended up specializing in pigs. Another guy, hardcore small animals, is now an equine vet. In my graduating class, when we had our 25 year reunion, one of my classmates is now a minister, one is an airline pilot, one is a physician. Um, there were like six people that completely changed careers. So you're, you're, keep your minds open, you're, you're going to change. We had two people drop out of veterinary school and then finish two degrees in other areas of biology once they got into school they decided it wasn't for them. So you have a flexibility. A veterinary degree gives you a wide based background. Oh, I'm sorry, I'm going for research. You know, cancer research, Alzheimer's disease research, you have a good background. To go on, many of these people got advanced degrees or specialties or something like that, but it gives you a really broad science background in animal fields and gives you less about food. Okay, so you must feel like you're really hard. I mean, if you want to work in a zoo or whatever you want to do, you need to get experience. So if you want to do pets, you're going to go work in a pet practice, you're going to go work in a farm, you know, uh, racetrack, you want to like horses. For zoos, the exotic animals, I'm just going to exotics includes pets, zoos, wildlife. You're going to have to seek out your own opportunities. So both zoos have locations for veterinary students to come out and spend a couple of months. A lot of students work in suburbs of places. This is all, of course, volunteer and paid. People work in wildlife rehab facilities. They work with exotic pets. They work in pet stores. They work in all kinds of places to get that experience that's, that, that's beyond dogs and cats. So you get lots of experience in vet student. Then you have to do, when you graduate, you get an internship. So in zoo medicine, the other difference from human medicine is you're not required to do postgraduate training. So you get your veterinary degree, submit you pass the board exam, you're off to practice in whatever practice you can find work. If you, you're not required to specialize. You, you have the option of doing that, and if you want to specialize, most people do an internship or a residency or both. And that's just to specialize in whatever area you want. And there are endless specialties. Large animals, small animals, poultry, surgery, ophthalmology, zoo medicine, Alternative medicine, uh, there's all kinds of uh, behavior, um, all kinds of specialists now in all different areas. So, many times, veterinarians will get out of practice for a few years and realize they really like surgery or behavior or nutrition and then do these residencies or internships later. Some people out of the vet school will go to do an internship. Or, so, an internship is right out of the vet school, a residency, and have at least one year of experience of either an internship or residency. So, you go to this college, you get the other experience, you get an internship, and then you want to get into Zoom. No, so you get another internship, and you keep finding zoos, and you don't get in. So you get another internship or residency. We get about, so the Columbus State has a residency program. We get about 30 applicants each year for that program, and most of them have the minimum qualifications to a degree and one year of experience. Those people need to make the first cut. Most of them have two, two internships. Our current res resident has three internships. Many of them have advanced degrees. A lot of them have field research. Some of them have publications. Just, and, and none of those are required to apply, but that's the competitive pool that you're trying to get into to get a zoo residency. I don't know about the other residencies. The difference is that in other specialties, there are a lot more residencies available. There are, I think, 22 zoo medicine residencies in North America. That includes, I think, three in Canada. So there's the, the, those are very, very competitive. And then you can job, that's easy part. So I can tell you, in, everyone that I know that's in a zoo residency is working in a zoo unless they choose not. So if you get to that stage, once you get your residency, then very likely you're going to end up um, working in a zoo. And most zoos, so Columbus has three, three veterinarians and a resident. Most, so Columbus is considered a large zoo. Most zoos our size have three or four veterinarians. Even small zoos will have two. And very small zoos, zoos of 500 will have one veterinarian. In many cases, those veterinarians work as curators too. So these little zoos that used to just do have a contract veterinarian come in are now hiring veterinarians because they realize all the things that veterinarians can do. They can do pathology, they can do nutrition, they can do animal management, they can do uh, education. So those, those people, veterinarians in small zoos, have a much broader uh, range of, of uh, job responsibilities. In fact, some of my colleagues would do that much prefer it. They would choose to stay in a small zoo rather than moving to a large zoo because they have so much, so much uh, flexibility in their job. How did I get there? Look at that enthusiastic young small animal veterinarian working on a pair. Don't you love those glasses? I'm just back in the uh, I graduated from the University of Illinois. 
and applied for internships and didn't get in. So I went to practice in a small, in a small animal practice in South Bend, Indiana. And I chose that practice because one day a week I got to be a zoo vet. Colorado is a small community zoo, 500 animals. Every Thursday, I wasn't at my practice, I was at the zoo being the zoo vet. And that's where a lot of <coughs> veterinarians get first experience consulting or working part time at a small zoo. Um, and I liked my animal practice a lot, but uh, I had an opportunity to do an internship in St. Louis a year later and then moved to St. Louis Zoo to do an in uh, sorry, a residency. When I finished that residency, they offered me a position, and I, and I took, took the job. So I grew up in Central Illinois, went to, went to school in Central Illinois, and my goal was to move out of the Midwest. So I moved to Indiana for a year, and then St. Louis Zoo for 25 years, two years ago, moved to Columbus. So I'm not doing very well as far as getting out of the Midwest. Two goals, move out of the Midwest and work at the zoo, so I'm happy. And I have nothing against the Midwest, don't get, don't get me wrong. I just wanted to live somewhere else. I spent all my life in the Midwest. So here I am. So it's been two years in a residency and stayed on staff for 25 years at the St. Louis Zoo, which is a zoo like Columbus, a lot of variety. And the nice thing about a big zoo is that it has lots of different animals. So you work on different species regularly. They have education programs, they have research programs in-house, they have field research programs or associated with programs. So you get opportunity for international travel, for international projects, and things like that. Um, and the thing I like the most about the job, like I said before, is the variety. There's always something different. And it's not just the amount of animals, the kinds of animals you deal with. Those change constantly. Ten years ago, we did almost nothing with amphibians. Now, amphibian medicine is a very well recognized specialty. We know a lot about them. Um, two years ago, I hardly worked on marine mammals. Now, I call them working on manatees regularly. It's already 20 years ago, no one did anything with fish. And now, fish medicine is a well recognized specialty. So, the uh, field is constantly growing. And things change. Animals, we're becoming aware of animals that are endangered. So, animal species are coming into the zoos that have never been in zoos before. With the, with the realization of the problem with amphibians, we're bringing all sorts of amphibian species in that no one's ever had in zoos before. So they're learning about their husband, bringing their reproduction and their diseases. So there's constantly new challenges. I'm regularly faced with animals or diseases I've never <coughs> dealt with before. Ten years ago, this is how we did with West Nile, arrived in the United States, it's killing all sorts of wild birds. It's killing zoo birds too, so we learned tons about West Nile disease that I hadn't even heard about. When I was in school, so always constantly change, and that's true of any part of medicine. But in zoo medicine, because of changes in the world and endangered species and global warming and all those things you know about, uh, the conservation issues are constantly changing. So uh, in most zoos, um, zoo veterinarians are actively involved in addressing those sorts of issues and being involved. In a zoo like Columbus Zoo, the veterinarians are involved in animal acquisitions and determining what the collection is going to be. Are we going to display African or Asian elephants and why? Are we going to keep health members in our zoo and endangered amphibian in North America? Are we going to participate in gorilla projects in Congo or paper projects in South America? Uh, so you get to you, you stay current and keep on the cutting edge of the documentary just for the zoo. My decision led me to, all right, twice running like you know what that is. Specifically, just primate. This is a lemur, Daiki Shabak, the most beautiful lemur in the entire world. Um, when I started to come at St. Louis, I wanted to be a cheetah guy. Uh, I love cheetahs, still do, and I wanted to you know, do cheetah research and go to Africa and work with cheetahs for a while. And I tried and tried and tried to get a cheetah project, but I couldn't get one. Because cheetahs are charismatic birds. Everyone loves cheetahs. Everyone wants to be a cheetah person. So the St. Louis Zoo, come to St. Louis Zoo, so I can use with them. St. Louis Zoo had always had a strong interest in Madagascar. Had lots of lemurs, lots of lemur success, lots of breeding programs. And I was asked to participate in one of the research projects. And so I went and asked my boss, I said, I don't care anything about lemurs. I don't really want to be a lemur guy, but they want me to do this project. And his advice was do the project, do a good job, and it will open up opportunities to you. And that's a piece of advice you should keep in mind. Never turn down an opportunity. So I started working with lemurs. It turned out there were like three people in the world that worked on lemurs, so I kind of became an expert by default which led to a trip to Madagascar to consult in their zoo, which led to now, last, I got back in September for my 25th trip to Madagascar. So from not ever wanting to do anything with lemurs, I've become now quite actively involved in doing field research with lemurs. We'll talk about that in a bit. Never know where you So when you go to vet school, you learn the domestic animals. Dogs and cats versus cows and chickens. Probably a little bit more since I was in vet school. So how does this prepare you to take care of zoo animals? Well, I mentioned veterinarians are better trained, or would be better, would be not fair. Well trained in medicine, you learn how to recognize pneumonia, you learn how to recognize diarrhea, you learn 
you know, 10 different causes of diarrhea, whether it's viral or bacterial or parasitic. You don't learn this parasite causes this disease in this animal. Well, you do, but when you, when you have a case of diarrhea, you don't immediately think groundworms. You think, okay, what could cause diarrhea? Bacteria viruses. And because you can take a more holistic, <coughs> system-oriented approach, you can work on it in an animal that you've never seen before. If you see a manatee with diarrhea, is that a cow? No. What's going to cause diarrhea in a manatee? Bacteria, viruses, parasites, nutritional abnormalities, same sort of things. So you're trained, starting in vet school, all the way through, to think about a systematic approach to problems. And that makes the job fun and exciting. And it really makes you think outside the box and give you lots of opportunities. So there's your domestic animals. Here's your zoo Uh Wolf is just a big dog. Tiger's just a big cat. Same drugs, same diseases, same vaccines. Most of our antelope are just modified. They're actually closer to sheep and goats than cows, because cows are kind of manufactured animals anymore. Um, lots of birds, but oops, a little bit out of chicken. So modified to human. Bird, bird. Zebra is just a striped horse. So you learn to make an extrapolation. Some things are very closely, some things don't. So what about sloth? Who knows what that is? What about a fish? You don't know anything about fish in, in school. Um, but you learn, like I said, you learn how to approach the system. So if you have a, a kid now with diarrhea, you know the same thing. What are the viruses? I don't have any idea. Find a book and look it up. Or you call Australia and ask what the kid is doing. The Zuba community is a very close-knit, well-working community. I call colleagues all the time and say, I don't have any clue what this is. What do you think it is? And they'll say, oh, I saw that, it's this. Or they'll say, I don't know what it is, but when you find out, let me know. Um, it's a constant learning experience. Lots of challenges in zoo medicine because of the variety. Here we have 4,000, well, we have 14,000 animals that come to zoo become fish. We have about uh, 3,000 birds, mammals, and reptiles. So we have a big collection and a big variety. Here we have 400 pound tortoises, we have venomous reptiles. You guys all see the rattlesnake surgery? We have a pig who's talking about hellbender. This is a North American salamander, native to Ohio, but now very endangered because of habitat destruction. Most of agricultural chemicals and runoff. So they need clear, fast running streams. Most of those are full of mud and silt and chemicals now. So that's been a major effort among zoos in North America to breed them in captivity and release them. So we talked about extrapolations, you know, these are sort of like things. Oops. When things aren't. Things aren't really like anything. Um, a, variety, a wide variety of small mammals, a wide variety of reptiles. Uh, if we talk about fish already. And birds, a lot of things you can, you can extrapolate are the same, a lot of things are quite really <coughs> different. And then small mammals, and there's rodents, and, and me, phone calls, <laughs> it's a bunch of phone. Um, so things you can extrapolate from, things you can, things you can learn from your colleagues. And size variation. The smallest patient is 20 gram hummingbird. Largest patient is 12,000 pound elephant. So you're dealing in multiple orders of magnitude. So a drug made for a cat, you might be able to do to use on a small bird, but it's going to take buckets of it to feed an elephant. So you learn alternative methods or uh, different formulas of compounding drugs. When we use the same drugs. There are I like two drugs made specifically to zoo animals and their anesthetics. Everything else are what you use in human. And what you use in pets, dogs and cats. All right, let's start with a tour of the zoo hospital. I'm on call, so if I get called, we'll go to the zoo hospital, okay? <laughs> this is the hospital at the Columbus Zoo. Dr. Cross was a physician and donated money for it many years ago. Um, uh, we're pure inside, like everywhere else. We are run out of office space, so we've got to fight in here. Uh, we have a small area for offices. So that's the area you run out of the most. Our treatment room looks pretty much like any animal treatment room. When I, when I give kids a tour, I point out this corner over here where the needles and syringes and bandages are. It's all the same. It doesn't matter if you're a dog, a cat, or a person. The syringe is a syringe. Some differences is this table is an equine surgery table. It holds 2,000 pounds. And it goes in very many human treatment rooms. It's hydraulic, so we can lower it and roll it out on wheels to the on. We have a wet sink, which you see in lots of veterinary clinics for doing messy things or washing things. Several scales of different sizes, you know what the animals are. And then our hospital has uh, packed in oxygen and suction in all the rooms. And 
because of course the standard small animal anesthesia machine. We also have a large animal anesthesia machine, and that just depends on the size of the patient. A couple of research labs. We do a lot of our clinical stuff in house. Um, so we do CBCs, chemistries. This is the chemistries out CBCs, fecals, cytology, cultures. And we do a lot of in house because there are a lot of commercial labs. Most of them don't do um, a lot of birds and reptiles, so we find we get better and accurate results when we do them in house. We have four full time technicians, uh, well, three full time, one's half time hospital manager, and, and four veterinarians kind of rest. So they have a pretty busy practice. Most hospitals, most veterinary hospitals in the zoos also function as quarantine. So everything that comes to the zoo is quarantined at least 30 days. That's to prevent the disease spread. And years ago, when animals came from the wild, quarantine was a bigger deal. Now, 98% of the zoo animals are born to other zoos. So bringing animals out of the wild is really unusual. It happens now and then in rescue situations, species declining quick, quickly in, in, in the wild. We may bring them into captivity and try to establish captive populations. Years ago, we used to say we're keeping animals in captivity uh, so they can be released in the wild in the future. Now, zoo people generally agree that that's not that's not reality. Animals, when there's habitat for animals, they're there. Animals, um, you know, African elephants are doing great in this for hunting. Tigers do very well if they have a place to go. So if there's habitat for animals, they're going to be there and they're going to be successful. So we're really not keeping them in captivity to be released. We're keeping them for educational purposes, for ambassadors. People come to the zoo and see cheetahs and fall in love and support the cheetah conservation. Um, for education for people and also education for ourselves. We, if I wanted to develop an aesthetic protocol for cheetahs, I'm not going to go to Africa and do it. I'm going to do it on animals. If we had an outbreak of canine distinctive in cheetahs, we can study it carefully in the zoo where we have control environment, you can do blood samples, you can do treatment, you're not going to be able to do that in the wild. If you didn't have an outbreak in the wild, you'd learn in captivity how to manage these animals so that you can take care of the animals in the wild. Uh, for veterinary Mary staff, this is Dr. Mayor. He's been at the Columbus Zoo for 10, 15 years. There was at the Oklahoma City Zoo before that. Uh, zoo guys tend to move around a lot, so your colleagues, the one job may then be uh, different colleagues at your next job, you may bump into the same people again. Again, it's a close link to the community, you know each other, and contact each other regularly. Dr. Wolf is director of research, she's actually on faculty at the vet school here. So she was vice president of animal health, she did my job before I came here. And then a couple of years ago, the OSU and the zoo set up a program which is 80% of the time at the vet school, as a professor of conservation medicine, to teach this sort of thing to veterinary students. 20% as the director of research at the zoo. And here she is doing this glamorous job of helping the Komodo dragon. And it is, I, I know she's saying it's okay or it's that big. She's trying to see that uh, if the tissue can not make the ovaries, it's going to be So Dr. Barry doing, oh, he's putting his uh, urine sample from an otter, because otters nest in the obviously. He's passing the catheter into the black and trying to make urine. A lot of what we do can be can be generally lumped into preventive medicine and clinical medicine. So you think yeah, so you're going to be treating you know, injuries and suturing animals and fixing broken legs and treating diarrhea. Probably two thirds of what we do is preventive medicine. So if you do your preventive medicine well, you have less clinical medicine. Preventive medicine is anything you do to prevent disease. So vaccinations and regular medical exams and checkups and those sorts of things that keep animals from getting sick. Dental work, uh, anything. In clinical medicine, <coughs> treating second injury animals. So animals get injured, they fight, they you know, trip and hurt themselves. Um, clinical medicine would be pneumonia, diarrhea, anything like that. Um, animals get old, they get geriatric, they get arthritis, they get heart disease, they get cancer. So um, that all fall into clinical medicine. So I mean, you're not always running around treating second injury animals. You're often taking care of preventive medicine. We also you guys probably know this, but we also don't spend a lot of time cuddling babies like you see on TV. Uh, most of the zoo animals know the vet and they are at all fond of us. Um, those that recognize us like the primary surgeon will throw things at us um, or spit at us or pee on us. Uh, even the animals that may not recognize us, for instance, a host talk is a good example, they recognize that I'm not the normal keeper. So if the keeper's around, they're acting relaxed, they're eating, they're you know, at ease, and they see somebody new. It could be me, it could be you, it could be they know that person's different, so they're going to act that way. We rely on our keeper staff, they're our pet owners. If, if 
they say a copy is limpy and then I go down there, the copy is going to be limpy when I get there. So we rely on the keepers. They're all professionals. Most of them have college degrees. I think ours are the all do. They work on same animals for years. So they'll call me and say, this animal's not quite right. Well, what's not right? Well, it's just not quite right. And, and the keepers are right. They know the animal. It's like you know your pets. You know, is it droopy? Is it not eating? Is it lethargic? Is it not playing well? Is there something wrong with this walk? They can't figure out exactly right what's right. But in a well-run zoo, a quality zoo, uh, the keepers are your pet owners, are the people who know everything about the animals and you can learn the land. We also rely on them for telling us what will work. We like say, you know, the best thing would be to give an animal IV fluids three times a day for a week, and you're going to say, forget it, you know, we can't get a hand from the animal. Will it take oral meds? No, it's a very picky eater. Can we dart it with antibiotics? Sure, you can dart it, and, you know, dart it once a day with antibiotics, um, and the animal tolerates it that very well. They also want to know what we can get into an animal. Will it take pills or liquid? Uh, you can put, some of our animals will take the topical fluids on if they're, they're tolerant. We use operant conditioning, we'll talk about that. Later. So, this used to be called training animals to do tricks, and we call operative conditioning. They perform behaviors that do tricks. And anything you can get an animal to do on a cue, it really helps the keepers and helps the veterinarians as well. Most of our, many of our animals will come up to their wire and hold their feet up so you can look at the claws, they'll open their mouth, so you can check their teeth. Some of them will press their abdomen up so you can ultrasound for pregnancy. We have some girls that'll press their chest up so you can do cardiac ultrasounds. So, anything that an animal will do on a cue, it helps the keepers and helps and helps the veterinarians as well. The basis of any medicine is routine exam. Whether you do dogs or cats, horses or cows, we do that. It's routine exam is where you get your basic information. Now, not all the animals at the zoo get annual physicals. So we did several more vets, we did that. And it's also probably not necessary. I tell people, think about yourself or your, or your kids. Or kids. They don't have kids. Uh, you know, a baby needs to see a doctor every year or every few months with a newborn. An old person, a geriatric person, a person with health problems, probably to see a physician every year. Or if you have diabetes or heart disease or something like that, you see a doctor every year. Young, healthy people like yourselves probably don't need to see a physician every year. Doing every five years, that would probably be reasonable. So that's how we approach zoo animals. There's no reason, in any procedure, anesthesia that is the biggest risk. So we, there's probably no reason to anesthetize this bear every year for an exam. This is a young, healthy bear, 10-year-old bear, no problems. There's no reason to risk any anesthesia. And I use the word risk hesitantly. We know so much about zoo medicine based on years of other people's experience that anesthesia protocols are usually pretty, pretty safe. However, there's always a risk. So unnecessary anesthesia we really try to avoid. And again, things like operating condition that can help avoid that. So your annual exam or routine exams, um, depending on the animal and the animal's condition. So here we're getting a bare physical and this um, high originating accretia in the exam. So anything that leaves or arrives at a zoo gets a complete examination. Before it leaves, it gets a complete exam, and the arrival at the zoo during its quarantine, they'll get a complete exam too. And that just helps us learn basic stuff. What is the animal's weight? It's really important. What do its teeth look like? Is that where its claws in good condition? Is it fat? Is it hair coat fat? Is it, can you can feel lumps and bumps in the abdomen. What can you learn about this animal, or what can you learn about this species? So, what does a bear's teeth look like? What does an echidna's teeth look like? Um, you know, how much does an adult koala weigh? All those things that then go into the medical record system and your own you know, mental storage unit to, to help you in the future. Um, your own mental evaluation. Um, uh, anyway, um, because animals get to be old, we take care of their teeth. We take care of them when they're young, they have them until they're old. Um, you know, historically, animals in zoos would live short lives. They die of infectious disease or malnutrition, things like that. Now, animals are living to be very old. We have the world's oldest gorilla at Columbus Zoo. Anyone know how old gorilla is? 58. People say, How long do gorillas live? The answer is, We don't know. We have one that's 58 years old and still doing well. She looks so old, she's a little slow, she doesn't have any health problems. We have a 50, a 38 year old brown bear. That's the oldest one ever recorded. In the wild, they would not live nearly that long. These are animals that were born in captivity. We know they were eight, perfect. We know how long they did. So they living to be really, really old animals. We had a really old monitor. We had a really old sign mag. Um, we kind of had a, kind of had a, a series of